probably knew, he had a mishap at his holiday house at Smoky Bay on the far west coast of the state and he had a trip to Royal Adelaide Hospital with the Royal Flying Doctor Service and since been in rehab and, and uh, it's good to see him back here tonight even without a walking stick and without any aid so welcome back. <laughs> now to our topic for tonight is a presentation from Lyle and I'll ask uh, Margaret Modra to introduce the speaker if he really needs introduction. Thank you. As <coughs> Jeff said, Lyle doesn't really need a lot of introduction. Um, because many of you would have known him when he was the archivist at Lutheran Archives. Now, he retired from this role in 2014, but he's still a regular visitor at our Folner meetings, for which we're very thankful. Lyle actually had another job before he became an archivist. He was a teacher. I suspect that he taught history lessons to his students. I don't really know, but that's, I think he did, yeah. Um, as that seems to be his passion. Lyle taught at Concordia College in Adelaide for nine years and at St Paul's College Walla Walla in New South Wales for 18 years. He then became the archivist at Luton Archives for 19 years. Even though he retired in 2014, Lyle just can't keep away from the place. So now he works as a volunteer at Lutheran Archives on two days each week. Lyle is also president of the Wend Sorb Society, isn't he, Ruth? <laughs> there are two ladies called Lois. When at the archives, he often has to defer to Lois, Sweck that is. However, he sometimes gets confused as his lovely wife is also called Lois but her surname is Cupcake. Now, Lyle tonight is going to tell us about the early settlers at Bethel near Kapunda, Germans, Wends, Moravians, Lutherans and others. So please welcome Lyle. Is that working? Yes. Well done, Bethany. Um, Bethel has a, a fascinating story. Bethel, that little, that little country, quiet country district in South Australia. It's an interesting community because of all the different groups that settled there. It's the only Moravian settlement in Australia. It has Germans and Wends living there. It has a Moravian church or had a Moravian, Moravian church, two Lutheran churches and a breakaway group. And it's that story that I'm going to tell you today. Next. It began in 1856 as a Moravian settlement under the leadership of the Moravian Brethren Pastor Christoph Samuel Daniel Schoendorf. In November 1855, Pastor Schoendorf purchased three square miles. Now that's 1,912 acres or if you're familiar with hectares, 774 hectares of land, nine kilometres west of the town of Kapunda. Copper mining had already been occurring at, there at Kapunda for over 10 years. So Kapunda was a busy and wealthy town. The land that Schoendorf bought, sections 259, 260 and 261 in the 100 of light cost a total of £3,124. 
on a small area of 35 acres or 14 hectares in the middle, they built a settlement with houses clustered together. They called their community Bethel, a biblical name meaning house of God. Now, if we can have the next screen, please. On the map, on the right-hand side of the map, I have circled the town of Kapunda, the copper mining town. On the left-hand side, I have circled the little settlement of Linwood on the main north road that some of you may be familiar with on the River Light. In the middle, in yellow, is Bethel. And above the yellow section is a little triangle and that's the position of the highest mountain there, Mount Light, in the range that is uh, just behind the settlement. The three sections two hundred in yellow are sections 259, 260 and 261. Three square miles. Now you can see there are three squares there. So they are one mile by one mile square, each of them. 640 acres in each square mile, isn't that correct? You remember that? Yeah, good on you, well done. <laughs> okay, in the middle of that yellow box, I've put a red dot. Can you see that? And that's the, roughly the position of their first settlement, the Moravian settlement. Well, we'll go on to the next one. Who are the Moravians? The Moravian Brethren Church, also known as the Unitas Fratrum, <coughs> which is Latin, meaning the unity of the brethren, is one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world, uh, denominations of Christianity, that is. Its origins are with the reformer Jan Hus in the 15th century in Bohemia, which is in modern-day Czech Republic. He was martyred in 1415, but his supporters included the Bohemian king and they continued to follow his teachings and the church in Bohemia grew. However, in the Counter-Reformation of the 1600s, the church was persecuted and members fled to other parts of Europe. One group hid in the neighbouring state of Moravia, which is in modern-day Slovakia. In 1722, the Moravian group approached a pious Lutheran nobleman in Saxony and asked for his assistance. His name, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, agreed to allow them to settle on his estate where they then established the town of Herrenhut, a term meaning under the Lord's protection. This town has become the centre of the worldwide Moravian Church, Moravian Brethren Church today. Some of their notable features are listed there. Number one, simplicity of faith and worship. Their church buildings are simple and plain in contrast to the elaborate buildings and decorations that you see in many mainstream church, Christian churches in Europe today. Secondly, they have a belief in the equality of all believers. Thirdly, they have a passion for mission. They had the first Protestant missions in the 1700s. They sent missionaries all over the world to Greenland, North America, South America, the West Indies, South Africa, many parts of Asia and even to Australia. 
Here they had a short-lived attempt at Coppera Manor on the Cooper's Creek in South Australia, just before the Lutheran missionaries came there in 1866. They had longer lasting missions at Point Pierce on York Peninsula in South Australia, in the Victorian Wimmera near Dimboola, known as Ebenezer Mission, in the Gippsland of Victoria at Ramayuk, and at several places in northern Queensland. A fourth feature of the Moravian Brethren is their community living. They endeavoured to live in close communities with enough people of different trades and skills to enable them to survive without needing help from others. Now, to, to illustrate some of these, I'll show you some photos of, I took at Heronhood a few years ago. Next one. Next screen, please. Oh, we've had that one. Next one. <laughs> Should be a photo. I have a commercial break. That's it. Thank you. Look at this photo of their church at Herrenhut. Notice, first of all, the simple cues. Probably not very comfortable. Fairly basic. More basic than the, one, than the ones you're sitting in. On the left, you will see at the front of the church a raised platform on which stands a simple table and a chair for the preacher to sit in. No fancy altar that we are familiar with, like this. On the side, you can see the gallery with a pipe organ. Music is very important for worship in their church. They have their own Moravian hymn book. Next, please. Look at the outside of the church and contrast that with the large and beautiful church buildings of Europe. It's hard to recognise this building as a church. It's just another building. Next, please. Now we go to the cemetery at Heronhut. Next. Good. Notice the stones lying flat on the ground. They are all the same size and they all have the same few details. The name of the person, the date of their birth and the date of their death. That's all. Equal in life, equal in death. Next. So to go back to the Moravians in South Australia. Now when I say Moravians, I don't mean that they came from the state of Moravia. These people were Germans who belonged to the Moravian church. They had come with other Germans in the large migration of Germans to South Australia in the 1840s and 1850s. Most Germans were Lutherans, as we know. But a few had joined the Moravian Church in Europe and in 1851, about 50 Mora Moravians 
li were living at Light's Pass here in the Barossa Valley. <clears throat> now these Moravians wrote to their church headquarters in Heronhood and requested that they send them a pastor. And in 1854, Pastor Schoendorf was sent to minister to them. Now who was he? He'd been born in Mecklenburg in the north of Germany in 1814. In 1837, he took a job as a bookkeeper or accountant at Klein Velka, a little village near Bautzen in Saxony, which was a Moravian settlement. He was very impressed with the Moravians and applied to join them. In 1839, he was accepted into the Moravian church. And while living in this community, he also learnt the Wendish language because he was close to Bautzen, to the city of Bautzen, which was the centre of the Wends in this region. So who are the Wends is the next question. The Wends are a Slavic people who have lived in Central Europe for the past 1,500 years. They're different from Germanic people. They have a distinct language similar to Polish or Czech and distinct customs and traditions. As the Germanic people moved eastward through Central Europe a thousand years ago, they came into conflict with the Wends and eventually conquered them. Most of the Wendish people assimilated into the German population. But some retained their distinctive Wendish language and culture and still maintain it today. Around 60,000 Wends live in an area known as Lusatia in English or Lausitz, known as Lausitz in German. Lusatia is centred around the two cities of Cottbus in the state of Brandenburg in the north and Bautzen in the state of Saxony in the south. The Wends are also known as Sorbs, not to be confused with Serbs in Serbia. In the years 1848 to 1860, through the 1850s, about 2,000 Wends migrated to South Australia and Victoria. Next, please. Right, look at the map of Lusatia marked in green. See the city of Cottbus at the top and Bautzen at the bottom near the Czech border. The blue line between the cities represents the river Spray which flows northward and on to Berlin. Now look to the left, look at the outline map of modern Germany and you can see the green section representing Lusatia southeast from Berlin and bordering with the Czech Republic on the south and Poland on the east. And the blue, red and white flag is the flag of Lusatia today. The photo of the girl on the right shows her wearing a dancing costume from a dancing group in one of the Wendish villages. Next please. Here is a photo of the city of Bautzen that I mentioned before. In the foreground, the river Spree is flowing past. You can see the walls around the old city and the towers. This city was not destroyed during the Second World War and still retains its medieval character. It's the centre of Wendish or Sorbian culture in Upper Lusatia. There is a Sorb museum and a Sorb institute there which promote their culture. Street signs are bilingual in German and Sorbian. Sorbian or Wendish. Next, please. Now look at the modern map of this area. At the top in the circle is the city of Bautzen. Just above it, marked with a rectangle, is the village of Klein Velka, 
where Schoendorf was working. You can see how close they are to each other. To the east of Bautzen is an area from which many winds left to migrate to Australia. And at the bottom, I have circled the town of Herrenhut, the centre of the Moravian Brethren. Bautzen and Herrenhut are only about 30 kilometres apart. So you can see that these winds would have been familiar with the Moravian church. Next, please. So back to the story of Christoph Schoendorf. In 1839, he became a member of the Moravian church. In 1845, he worked as a tutor in Polish Russia. Then he went to Switzerland for a time and then back to Polish Russia. And in this time, he felt the call to be a Moravian pastor and he applied to the church. In 1853, they ordained him at Klein Velka and sent him to South Australia to be the pastor to the Moravian community at Lights Pass. He was 40 years old when he arrived in South Australia and the Moravian families in this community included the names John or Jön, Hompsch, Kornetsky, Rody, Schroeter, Walscott and Winter. A few kilometres from Lights Pass was the settlement or is the settlement of Ebenezer. This was first settled in 1852 by a large group of Wends from Upper Lusatia near Bautzen under the leadership of Johann Swa. These were Lutherans, but they only occasionally had the services of a Lutheran pastor, Maya, from Bethany, who was busy ministering to Lutherans all over the Barossa. They wanted a preacher who could speak their Wendish language. When Pastor Schoendorf arrived at Lights Pass, the Ebenezer Wends were pleased to go to his services at Lights Pass and they even asked him to preach at Ebenezer, which he agreed to do every two or three weeks. Although we know he could speak Wendish to the Wends, we have no evidence that he actually preached in Wendish. Nevertheless, these Ebenezer Wends were happy with his services to him, to them. He baptised their children and conducted their marriages. Next, please. However, Schoendorf did not want to stay at Lights Pass. He had the idea of forming a separate Moravian community. And so he bought this land west of Kapunda and in 1856 started the settlement of Bethel. The Moravian families that joined this settlement in the early years include the names Schoendorf, of course, Arnold, Goy, Gerdica, Gruel, Hasting, Hilbig, Homsch, Kirsch, Kornetsky, Kruger, Linky, Peltz, Schmidt, Thomas, Vogt, Wagner, Wenke and Winter. You can see it's quite a large community, a large number of names there. They quickly built homes and a building to serve as a church and school. These were built in a central location. Remember that map, the yellow? These were built in a central location and at first the people lived together in a central village. Land was then subdivided into 88 blocks and shared amongst the different members. However, it didn't take long before the people realised that it was impractical to live centrally and travel out every day to work on their distant blocks. And so they began to build their homes on their blocks 
and the idea of a community village of Moravians eventually came to an end. At the same time, the surrounding land was being bought by other settlers, and many of these were Germans and Wends, and here are some of their names. Uh, no, go back, please. There. Here are the Germans, Becker, Fegert, or originally uh, written in the, in the uh, register as Fickert, Grefer, Gregor, Hübner, Just or Just, Klenner, Menz, Feiler, Rohde, Scheer, Ulrich, Wehr, Weikert and Weiss. They were all German Lutherans. And then there were Wens, Albinus, Altus, Dekey or Dirkia, Kubash and Wenke. And they were Lutherans too. These were Lutherans, but like the Ebenezer Wens, they were happy to attend the services of the Moravian pastor Schoendorf in the Bethel Church. He baptised their children and conducted their marriages and burials. Now next. One of these, Peter Dakey, built a school on his land in 1860 because he said that the Bethel School conducted by Schoendorf was overcrowded and his school was known as Steintal. Now, I've circled that in blue and the red writing in the middle is the position of that Steintal school building. And you can see it's right alongside that yellow section where the, which the Moravians owned and all the way around those other little smaller blocks, they're all smaller blocks, usually around about 80 acres, um, were bought by these German and Wendish settlers. Uh, where are we? So he built this uh, school at Steintal. And when Lutheran pastors occasionally visited this district, they would also preach there to the Lutherans. At other times, many of the Lutherans attended the Moravian services at Bethel. So there was good relations between them. At this point, I wish to mention that the records of baptisms, marriages and burials, which were started by Pastor Schoendorf at Lights Pass and continued at Bethel, are really some of the best church records I've seen. They're at the Lutheran archives now and can be inspected there. From these records, I have worked out which were the Moravian families and which were not. And I want to demonstrate that today. So we'll go to the next one. The baptism records follow a pattern. Date of birth, <coughs> place of birth, date of baptism, name of child, name of parents, name of godparents. Now the key to this is the place of birth. On this entry, the place of birth is mentioned and I've put it in yellow and it's in German, of course, German writing, which a few of you might be able to pick out. Verda by Bethel, section number 255, Geboren. And that means born near Bethel on section number 255. Now, section number 255, if you, if you recall those numbers I gave you before, is not one of those inside the Moravian settlement. It's outside the Moravian settlement. And so these people would not have been Mor Moravians in that original Moravian settlement. Let's look at the next one. This one, in this entry, we have the words Würde here in Bethel Geboren. That means was born here at Bethel. Now that suggests they were part of the Moravian settlement, doesn't it? And we'll look at the next one. Würde in Bethel al here Geboren means the same thing. It was also, uh, also means was born here at Bethel suggesting that this family also was part of the Moravian settlement. And the next one, this one says, 
Verita here in Bethel, section number 260A, Geboren. That translates as, was born here at Bethel on section 260A. Section 260 was part of that Moravian settlement. So these were members of that community. We get other clues in the marriage records. We'll go to the next one. This record, this records the marriage between, and in yellow at the top one, I've got the De Junggesell, Andreas Lischke, and in the bottom yellow, Jungfrau, Marie, Marie Altus. That is between the bachelor and the maiden, or unmarried woman. All right? Let's look at the next one. Right, this one's a bit different. The next one says it's between der ledige Bruder and the ledigen Schwester. That is between the unmarried brother and the unmarried sister. The use of the terms brother and sister suggests that they were Moravians. And finally, the next one, next example. This one's a marriage between der Junggesell, the bachelor, and der Ledigen Schwester, the unmarried sister. So this suggests that the man was not Moravian, but the woman was. As well as that, the Bethel burial records are really most detailed obituaries and sometimes they even mention the date when the person joined the Moravian church. And so as a result of this investigation, I've compiled the following list of early members that I showed you before, but there it is again. The Moravian families, Schoendorf, Arnold, Goy, Godeke, Gruel, Hastings, Hilbig, Homsch, Kirsch, Kornetsky, Kruger, Linke, Peltz, Schmidt, Thomas, Vogt, Wagner or Wagner, Wenke, Winter. We'll hear some of those names again later. And the Germans are there again and the Wens. The Wens, just to repeat them, Albinus, Altus, Dakey, Kubash, Wanky. Right, next. So to return to Steintal, today only the cemetery remains. That was alongside the school. Here is the grave of Peter Dakey, who died in 1906 on the left there. And the other picture on the right shows some other graves. And the next... Back to Bethel. Schoendorf remained as pastor there for just over 20 years. But life in the Moravian settlement wasn't always harmonious. At some stage, one of the members discovered that they didn't have any claim on the individual blocks of land that had been given to them and on which they had built their homes and worked their land. The ownership of the whole block of three square miles was still legally in Pastor Schoendorf's name. Uh, this was eventually settled in a court case with Pastor Schoendorf continuing to hold the title, I believe. But over time, Schoendorf's health declined and in 1877 he retired to a large house that he had built for him. And now I go back. Uh, the photo on the left shows the house from a distance, from looking from where the Bethel Church is today. It's out in the middle of a paddock there. And on the right, you can see that it is in ruins today. Um, Yes, go on to the next one, please. 
Uh, that's a close-up of the ruins again. And on the right is a picture of a well-constructed underground tank, constructed with bricks, that is still there today. Um, it seems that some disagreement developed between Schoen, Schoendorf and Jacoby. Uh, move on to the next one. Yeah, leave it there, please. When a few people came to Schoendorf instead of Jacoby for um, baptisms, Jacoby protested and appealed to the authorities at Hernhut for their decision. They supported Jacoby. When Schoendorf persisted, he was excommunicated. He continued to minister to a small, loyal group until his death 20 years later. A small cemetery with 12 graves remains next to the ruins of his house and he is buried in the middle. And that shows the cemetery on the left and there's a stone there in the middle, roughly. You can possibly pick out the white stone. That's his grave. Close up of it on the right. Number ten, I think it is, is it? Number ten with his with his name on it. Um, you have to walk across a paddock to get to it. I'm not sure how whether there's legally public access or not. I know when I took Jedrick Marling there she wanted to see his grave, I think it was you had to walk to five o'clock. Yeah. yeah there may be an easement, I'm not sure. Yeah. I've never checked. I've just tiptoed through. Um, <clears throat> right. During Pastor Jacoby's, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> During Pastor Jacoby's time, some members moved to York Peninsula and purchased larger blocks of land to farm around South Kilkerran. They established a Moravian congregation there and Pastor Jacoby visited them regularly. <clears throat> Next, please. In 1891, Pastor Jacoby died and was buried at Bethel. The Moravian Church then sent out Pastor Buck. He is noted for his decision to build a new substantial church. Here it is, the present church building, built in 1895. <clears throat> Note the inscription on the front wall. Uh, close up of on the left, the words Bruderkirche, Brethren Church. Next, please. There is another interesting feature at the front. Look at the entrance to the porch. On the left, there are steps up to a door. But on the right, hidden on this photo, there are also steps to another door. Men entered through the left door and sat on the left side of the church. Women and children entered through the right door and sat on the right side of the church. No mixing allowed in church. Now, some of you may well remember this custom of sit sitting separately also existed in the Lutheran church in Australia. In my congregation in my childhood, in the 1950s and 60s, I recall four older couples who sat apart, men on the left, women on the right. My grandparents were one of these. And men received the Holy Communion before the women. Now, inside the church, you can see on the other photo, the gallery, the present day gallery at the rear of the church. Next, please. In 1907, Pastor Buck returned to Germany. The congregation asked the church authorities at Herrenhut for a replacement pastor, but they refused to send one. So what were they to do? They applied to join the Lutheran Church, the small Emanuel Synod AAG, and were sent Pastor Bemmon from New South Wales. Then the Steintal congregation closed their church and school and its members joined in with the Bethel 
Lutheran congregation now. Next, please. At this point, I wish to mention that the Moravian pastors and members at Bethel and South Kilkerran regularly reported to the headquarters at Herrenhut in Germany. In their archives at Herrenhut, the correspondence between them is all well preserved. This photo shows the archivist with the box relating to Bethel. I think it would be very interesting to find out what is in this file. I know that Lois Sweck has had a look at it a few years ago and photocopied a few letters. But there would be a fascinating story there if someone had the time to explore it. And as Lois says, probably a PhD thesis. <laughs> I asked the archivist if they would ever digitise this file but he said it has too low a priority for them. This congregation is such a small part of the larger story of Moravians throughout the world. Now, with becoming a con Lutheran congregation, the Bethel people were faced with certain changes. Next, please. First of all, in the church, inside the church building. The photo on the left shows the Moravian setup with the table and chair at the front, just as we saw earlier at Hernhut today. The photo on the right shows the interior a few years ago with the tra traditional Lutheran altar. However, the Lutheran altars in 1907 usually had a pulpit overhanging the altar. Next. Like that one. This is a photo of Peter's Hill Church. This was the custom in Lutheran churches in the 19th century, the pulpit overhanging the altar. It was only in the 1920s and 30s that many remodelled their altars and placed the pulpit separately to the side. Let's have a look at the Bethel Cemetery. Here on the left is the entrance arch with the words, it is appointed under men once to die but after this the judgment. A sombre warning to all. But on the back, on the right, when you read, which you read as you leave the cemetery, we have a more comforting message. Christ is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Next. In the old section, we have the Moravian graves. This photo shows the Moravian section in the foreground. Women on one side, men on the other. Notice the gravestones that are flat on the ground. The next photos show close-ups of the headstones. There we are. On the left is August Winter, August Winter, with his name, date of birth, date of death, and the word Heimgegangen gone home, gone to his heavenly home. This is the traditional style that we saw earlier in the Moravian Cemetery at Herrenhut. The photo on the right has merely the number of the grave and the name of the person, A.R. Hubner, my great-great-grandmother. She didn't get a large headstone, either because she was not a member of the Moravian congregation or perhaps because her husband then left the district and moved to New South Wales to join his son. Next, here are two more headstones. On the left is Pastor Jacoby, who died in 1891. And on the right is Adam Winky, who died in 1911, one of those wins. The headstones would have been laid flat on the ground originally, but at some stage the graves have been renovated and the headstones have been placed upright. Next. Here are two more which have additional stones added recently by descendants to provide more information. Johann Dakey and Anna Kubash Nee Dakey, who arrived in South Australia in 1855 on the ship Bielefeld. And the next. Here's another 
commemorating Friedrich Wilhelm Rohde and his wife Charlotte, who arrived on the Wundram in 1854. The traditional Moravian headstone has again been placed upright more recently. But look at the grave on the right. Johann Ernst Dekey and his wife Augusta Louisa Friederike. She died in 1912 and he in 1940. What do you notice about the headstone? They look just like those in so many Lutheran cemeteries of this period, as we saw earlier at Steintal. A lot more decorative than the plain Moravian stones, with hymn verses to console the grieving family and standing upright. So changing the church from Moravian to Lutheran is reflected in the style of the headstones in this cemetery. These are two of the changes that occurred when they joined the Lutheran church. The change of the altar and the change of the cemetery. However, not everything changed. They did retain their Moravian hymn book for some years afterwards. It is likely there were other changes too because within a few years there were disagreements in the congregation. As in many communities, people generally don't like to make too many radical changes at once. So I think that was the problem here when the Lutheran pastor came. He made so many changes that he upset some of the former Moravian members. And there may have been personality issues too. So that in 1910, we have a schism. It came about this way. There were two travelling preachers going around country South Australia preaching the gospel message and endeavouring to make converts to Christianity. One was an Irishman by the name of Sam Jones. The other was a New Zealander, Jim Murray. Upon hearing of the disharmony at Bethel, they decided to go there. While walking along a road, they saw a man walking, working in his paddock and spoke to him. His name was Herman Goy. They asked if they could hold a gospel meeting in the district. Goy told them to ask the Lutheran pastor. If he wouldn't let them use the church, they should ask the bandmaster. If, he, if they could use the band hall. If both refused, he said they should come back to him and use his home. Both Pastor Behman and the bandmaster refused them. So they returned to Herman Goy and held a meeting in his house. Those who were unhappy and had complaints about the Lutheran Church continued to attend the regular meetings that were held there in this house. They were attracted to the message that Sam Jones and Jim Murray presented. Pastor Behman was concerned that many of his members were attending these other gospel meetings and he gathered the people in the church to discuss the matter. When he started to, to condemn those visiting preachers, 24 of those present got up and walked out. And their names... Matz, Goy, Vogt, Schmidt, Dakey and Linky. These accepted the teachings of the travelling preachers. They were baptised by immersion in the river. They never returned to the Lutheran church and their descendants still remain part of this church today. So next, what is this church? It's the church with no name. Of course, they've been given names by others over the years. Go preachers, two by twos, the way, tramp preachers, Irvinites, Cooneyites, Christian conventions. The name two by twos reflects their practice of preachers always being in pairs. 
They followed the pattern set by Jesus when he sent his disciples out in pairs to preach, as recorded in Matthew 10, Mark 6, and Luke 9 and Luke 10. Their origins are in the Irish evangelical revivalist movement from 1899 on. Their founder was William Irvine, hence the name Irvinites, and a close follower, Edward Cooney, hence the name Cooneyites. The movement spread rapidly to Scotland and England and then preachers went to the USA, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, South Africa, South America, China and all over the world. Within a few years, thousands of converts were made. When Irvine adopted Adventist teachings and moved to Jerusalem to await the second coming of Christ, he, re he was rejected by the other uh, church leaders of this church. He died in Jerusalem in 1947. Edward Cooney was also rejected. He moved to, to Australia and lived with loyal supporters at Mildura until his death there in 1961. Because this church often attracted Christians who were dissatisfied with their Christian denomination, this church was accused of enticing people away from their churches. Consequently, they were strongly attacked by the mainstream churches and the name Cooneyites was used in a hostile way by their opponents to describe them. However, the members of this church call themselves Christians and of course don't like the name Cooneyites being given to them. So I will not use this name, but to identify them, I will call them the church with no name. In the last year, I have come to know one family who are descendants of the Bethel Breakaway Group. They are still members of the church with no name, and they have shared with me their beliefs and experiences. I value their friendship and their openness a bit with me about their church as I've tried to understand just what happened at Bethel in 1910 and I don't wish to disparage their church in any way. I believe they are sincere Christians who wish to worship God in their own way. Next. Oh, that's it. This church could be described as a home church. They have no church buildings, but they worship in homes and public halls. Sunday worship is conducted in their homes, in small groups, and gospel meetings are held during the week for larger groups. There are always two preachers at gospel meetings, each delivering a sermon. The services have no elaborate liturgy, just hymns, sermons and prayers. They have their own hymn book. The preachers work together in pairs. They're generally unmarried. They have no fixed place of abode but they move around from family to family. There is no large, obvious organisation or bureaucracy. I expect that there is some accepted hierarchy within the preachers. Next. They hold annual conventions in each state of Australia and in other countries too, in the world. In South Australia, they are held on the property formerly owned by Herman Goy at Bethel. Members from all over South Australia come together for a number of days each year. The gatherings have become so large that they hold two conventions in consecutive weeks to accommodate everyone. And a third one is even held at Wilmington for the people of Eyre Peninsula. They do not provide much information about their church to the public. For this, for this reason, they've been accused of being rather secretive. The most readily available information about them is provided by members who have left their church. A website titled Telling the Truth, compiled by former members, contains a lot of detail about the history of this church. 
I am interested to compare the teachings and practices of this church with that of the Moravian Brethren Church. Some common features are evident to me. Both churches prefer simplicity in their worship and in their buildings. Both churches have a passion for mission, for spreading the gospel message. The church with no name call their preachers missionaries and continue to send them to countries throughout the world. Both churches have an emphasis on the equality of believers. No big hierarchy of within their churches. Both churches have strong feelings of community of believers. There is a lot of care for members within the church. So why did the schism occur at Bethel in 1910? I suspect that the attitudes of the Lutherans who took over in 1907 clashed with the attitudes of the Moravians and caused friction. The visiting preachers of the church with no name promoted ideas which were similar to the Moravian ideas and thus attracted them. The families that broke away were all former Moravians or related to them. The Goy, Linky, Schmidt and Vogt families were former members of the Moravian congregation, while the Dakey and Matz families had intermarried with them. Next. So what is there at Bethel today? The Moravian settlement is long gone. Descendants of the Germans and Wends still live there. With the changes in the farming industry over the last 50 years, bringing the formation of larger farms, the number of people in the district has dramatically reduced, as has happened in all country districts. However, the Lutheran Church remains as the prominent building in this district and is still used. The small congregation worships there each week, either with a pastor or with a lay reader. The cemetery is still maintained and used. Not far from the church on Church Road is a large commercial chicken farm. And over the hill there is a buzz of activity in November each year when the church with no name hold their annual conventions on Herman Goy's old farm. Well, thank you for listening to that story. Thank you, Long. Now, the opportunity for anybody to ask questions, and if you can wait until I get the microphone to you. most interesting talk. The funds that Pastor Schondorf brought with him for his £3,000 to buy the land, how did they come about? Um, he borrowed a lot of that money and had to pay it back over time, obviously, from like most people who bought land and still buy land. OK, any others? Yeah. I found this very interesting for two reasons. I came tonight because Lyle and I have had many talks uh, down through the years about the Fiegert family, which is my mother's family, and the history book, the Fiegert history book, claims that we are Wens, and of course Lyle has maintained that they're Germans. Uh, I must see the marriage certificate because Anna Altus married August Fiegert. And there's a very romantic story in the Altus book, which, which I found just by accident going to the Kapunda Library. It was sort of meant to be. Anna was 10 when the figures arrived and their arrival with their 
eight sons and two daughters in 1856 was, of course, great. Amazing, really. And Anna took one look at the oldest son and said, I'm going to marry you. And when she was 19, she did exactly that. Now, Anna Fergett is in the cemetery. Her, her grave is there. Uh, and I've seen it and I've taken photos. My great, great uncle is buried at Rhiney, where they moved to for a while. When the, he died, she moved back with her daughter, <coughs> who was uh, still living at Bethel. But the other thing has just blown me away, I have to say. Um, my English grandparents, my father's family, were, were the, way, the way, in the way. And they were English migrants and they had a real, really bad run, which I won't tell you about. But anyway, there were five sons and one daughter and the, in the way, they were called, took them under their wing. And they, we, we were led to believe they were a break off of the Plymouth Brethren and they were very, very strict. My grandparents were not allowed to actually mingle with anybody who wasn't in the way. And of course, my father was a racing driver and very, <laughs> well, he was that kind of a bloke. And he married my mother and he was not religious and he was completely just cut off until I was born. And then my grandmother decided she'd rewrite the rules a bit. Uh, so I was, I was just amazed that that was where they came from in, uh, in Bethel. It's been fascinating. Mm. Thank you, Lyle. And I look forward go. to seeing the m wedding certificate of... August, Figert and Anna Altus, because I'm quite sure it may really, for once and for all, unveil who yeah. we actually are, German or Wendish. Yeah, have a look. Yes, I think I've always said to you, um, they didn't, the Figerts didn't come from that area in Lusatia, and they're the only ones we know for certain were Wendish when they came to Australia. Of course, Wends covered a larger area of Europe, and as I said earlier, they had assimilated into the German population. But maybe there were a few here and there uh, who still maintained some of their Wendish, Wendish language, language and custom. And there's a large, and it's either Wendish uh, family speaking German or German family speaking Wendish. And my girlfriend, when we were outside the church, would you believe, looking up, she's perfect with microphone, weeping in, and she found it. She found. Uh, and it was in 1856, and my family had arrived in 1855. Big family, and I would think somehow that made its way down to, to Wicca, Wikimedia. But, but I can honestly say I don't remember whether they were a German family who spoke Wendish or a Wendish family that spoke German, but it was actually in Wikipedia. Thank you. <coughs> now... Lyle mentioned earlier on <coughs> about Hern Hut in Germany. How many people have been there? Yeah. Herrenhut. 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 Where the, the, where the church is in Germany, the, the original church of the Moravians. A few people. So quite a few of you have been, I've been there as well, oh, in yeah. cemetery. It, certainly if you go to that area of uh, Germany, don't miss it. Yeah. Lovely, lovely yeah. town. A uh, very interesting museum there, which uh, contains items that the missionaries all over the world, Moravian missionaries all over the world, sent back to the Herrenhut, and they're on display there. And, uh, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Did you put your hand up, Oliver? Yeah, just put a comment. Even Russian Hang on, wait a minute. Kuniite, so, oh, sorry, followers of the way. Um, my great-grandfathers brother had a number of sons who went to the west coast to open up the land there. Mm. They were dissatisfied with the church and they, I don't think they had anything to do with it. The Cuneites came across them in about eight, uh, 19, no, 18 or 19 mm. and three of them became members mm. and their descendants are still members so I've got a whole branch of my family. Um, interesting. The brothers all married three sisters from Adelaide, reasonably well off, and the family was so upset. 
when they married these sons. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, <coughs> well, I've got a question. Um, you, you asked who's been to Heronhut. Who's been to Bethel? Who's been to Bethel in oh, South Bethel. Australia? Yeah. A few of us, yes. Oh, um, I, went to the, experience. I went to the 150th anniversary and the booklet's quite good, but it never mentioned the breakaway group. It's very interesting. Mm. Thanks, Lon. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes? At the back there. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lyle, that's been really interesting and I really appreciate um, what you've told us about Bethel. Um, I've got a lot of links um, with the place because my mum was evoked and the Pelters and the Schmitz are all part of that family group. And you've answered some questions. I don't really have a question for you, but you've, I think you've answered some questions in my mind uh, about the influences on my mother's, um, in my mother's family and her upbringing. Um, which led to her being baptised by immersion in 1969. Uh, she always struggled with, uh, with infant baptism. And I, I think her father, Arthur, uh, invoked also, and um, her mother was a linky as well. Mm -hmm. So there was, it wasn't talked about <laughs> in those days, really, um, this background. Mm -hmm. And I was vaguely aware that Moravians were involved. I really wasn't involved, um, really wasn't... Um, Occasionally, Cooneyites were talked about, the church with no name was talked about, but it was like something out there. And I really didn't know much about it at all. Mm. And I think you filled in a few gaps for me. And um, um, I've had the privilege of, I think, preaching at Bethel as well at the Pelts reunion. And um, it's a beautiful church, and I, I'm so glad it's still, it's still um, continuing, um, as many of our churches have closed. But this one has just got such great history. And I really thank you for that. Thank you. <clears throat> of course, you can remember the Pinery Fire uh, that went very close to that church. Mm, and, that's uh, right. Yeah. 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 Thanks for the talk, Lyle. That was really fascinating. Can you tell us whether the Moravian Brethren are similar to some of the other Brethren churches that are incredibly strict and and quite secretive, or are they different again? Um, I'm no authority. Um, I don't think they're as, as strict, uh, is my impression. Um, you know, the groups like the Exclusive Brethren and the Plymouth Brethren, you, you often hear about being very strict I don't think the Moravians are as strict as them, but I might be wrong. Um, how do you measure these things? Uh, um, uh, what, what else can I say? I don't know. Probably can't really okay. say much more. Greg, we might have a better idea. Or we would yes, have a better idea. Yes, the origins are very different. The uh, Plymouth Brethren, often known as the Derbyites, yeah. Uh, from Plymouth in England, 1840s, something like that. Much yeah. more recent. Yeah. Moravian. Yeah. Yes. I think that point you make, the origins are different, probably indicates different attitude, different um, practices and so on. When was English spoken in the Bethel district? I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, I could only imagine that it was probably around about the same time as um, it, in many other districts in South Australia, after the First World War, 1920s probably, um, when uh, many of our ancestors decided that they better not speak German anymore, uh, particularly in outlying regions where they were in a minority, only in the Barossa area where there were a majority uh, German Lutherans did it probably remain a bit longer. Just wondering, the two, two uh, missionaries, the one from Irish Ireland and from New Zealand, mm -hmm. did they know each other? Did they know each other? Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Oh, before they came out. Uh, look, oh, I'm not too sure. I'd have to have a look up the, uh, uh, the website on, about their story. Um, Sam Jones, uh, I think, was over in Western Australia before he came to South Australia. And I don't know that he... Uh, no, look, I don't really know all the details there. Um, Okay, uh, I think we <clears throat> might need to draw this to a close. There's a question time for now, and um, you're welcome to all stay for supper, and you're all welcome to speak to Lyle afterwards. So, on behalf of our group here tonight, I'd sincerely like to thank uh, Lyle. <clears throat>